Yes. Yep. All right. Well, we'll get going because we have a really full program of, of, about, about a park that we really love a lot, Wakaiva Spring State Park. So we'll have some announcements, a plant of the week, a mystery bird, and this week in Central Florida birding, and then the program, Wakaiwa Spring State Park with the bird check team. And next week, it's Orange Audubon's regular monthly program, which is going to be 150 years of wildlife conservation history by Dr. Mark Madison. He's the historian at the Museum for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which is located in Shepherdsville, West Virginia. And he's been in that position for 40 years, and it, that one should be really fascinating. That one, you just go to YouTube Live. Just go to YouTube, our YouTube channel, Orange Audubon Society, and it'll pop up at seven o'clock. All right, then we're back to the bird chat format on May 27th, and we're gonna do summer birding in the June challenge with the bird chat team. And then June 3rd, Kathy has booked Hannah and Eric go birding, and that one should be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. All right, I wanna tell you that this Saturday, there is a dragonfly identification workshop at Orlando Wetlands Park that's taught by uh, two longtime members of Orange Audubon, Mary Kime and Randy Snyder, who are excellent all around naturalists and they really know Wetlands Park. But they've been um, volunteers out there for many, many years and they're really good on their dragonflies. I'm gonna take that workshop. I have taken it before. Um, I, I try to learn a little bit more each time. And um, I really recommend we have some spaces in it it's only $10 for Audubon members that if you're at all available and interested, you quickly contact Teresa, okay? mwilliams at cfl.rr.com. And here we got a cool picture of a great crested eating a dragonfly. And then on um, May 22nd, Saturday, we have an Oakland Nature Preserve bird survey with Kathy and there's her email to register. Okay, going on to plant of the week. I picked the longleaf pine because we're going to be talking a lot about the sandhill habitat, which is dominated by this pine. And um, this um, um, pine <coughs> here at Wakaiwa Spring State Park um, is, uh, they were logged and these are growing back. And the way you tell the longleaf pine is the needles are very long um, over a foot in some cases. And they're always in groups of three. Plus the, and by the way, you could just look on the ground and, and see the needles and, and tell your pines that way. And the cones are very large. I'm talking um, about six inches. Those are the ones people use for Christmas ornaments or bird feeders. You can put peanut butter in them and use them for bird feeders. Okay, so they get really old and in Georgia, which is part of their range um, at near Tall Timbers is are some of the oldest ones. And um, Teresa takes um, the gr a group to the Panhandle every year to Tall Timbers Research Station. And this shows some of the participants um, showing how big one of the old longleaf pines will be but they've mostly been logged out because they're excellent timber. Now they're very fire adapted. And when they're first shooting up, they have what's called the grass stage. And as the fire burns, the needles vaporize and keep the growing tip cool enough to survive. And meanwhile, in this grass stage, they're getting a deep tap root. Um, if you plant one in your yard, don't try to don't decide later that you want to move it. I learned that the hard way because that taproot gets really deep. And the longleaf pine is the nesting site for the red cockaded woodpecker. And the deal is that older longleaf pines get heart rot. And that's so the woodpecker is able to make the cavity nest hole in it. The, the red cockaded is the only one that makes a cavity in a living tree. And so it really needs these old longleaf pines with the heart rot. All right, that's all I'll say about the longleaf pine. And I'll turn it over to Jack for the mystery bird. 
Hi, everybody. Uh, we're doing Mystery Bird, and your clue is the talon. So if you want to guess, or if you know what bird this is, by looking at the talon, uh, put it in the chat. And we'll see. Um, oh, my. That's pretty good. That is good. Yeah, first one got it. So they said great horned owl. We go to the next slide. And this is the actual slide where I zoomed in on the, uh, the foot. Great horned owl, this, this photo was taken at Laud. Okay, and the second mystery talon. And again, if you could type it in chat as to which bird this is. Okay, Delcy thinks it's a bared owl or barred owl. Um, that is correct as well. She can move to the front of the class. <laughs> I thought she's like, <laughs> very, very good. Next slide. There we go. And uh, this barred owl was taken at uh, Three Lakes. And the third one, Mystery Talon. Ah, <laughs> oh, very good. <laughs> Let somebody else answer once in a while. Uh, but, but yeah, it's, it's an osprey and you can look at their talons and they, they literally look like fish hooks. Um, they're, just, they're just very, very well adapted. And this photo was taken at Lake Apopka just like the great horned owl was taken at Lake Apopka. And that's our mystery birds for this evening. Great, thank you, Jack. Cute. Okay, so our new feature is this week in Florida birding. And I wanna mention before I start sharing these that um, if you're in Florida, you visit Florida and you wanna send us photos of what you've seen in the week, you can just send them to um, the, what, the email at the end of the program because we'd love to feature your pictures. So this week we're featuring photos from Lori Lilja, oh Lori, I hope I'm not mispronouncing your last name. And Lori gets around, she sees lots, oh good, yay. She sees lots of awesome birds and takes great pictures. So here's a white-winged dove, which are here, but they're not really easily found most of the time. Um, you might get lucky and get some at your feeder and they are pretty regular on the wildlife drive, but hit or miss. I, you know, I might see one out of every many times we go. And right now is a great time to see the least bittern. This time of year, they're actively nesting, um, either building nests or they're feeding young. So they're awesome to see just flying like little bullets and then landing and see if you could still see them. And Lori got a, a wonderful shot of one perched up on a branch at Lake Apopka. And then we have our beautiful purple gallinu. And that's another one. Um, they're pretty showy, but depending on time of year, they like to really get down in the um, in the lilies and the water vegetation and they disappear. <laughs> it's amazing. But now as they're having uh, chicks, they're out feeding them. So you might get lucky and see them. This one was also taken by Lori at, at Laud. And here's one of our migrants. Now we didn't have much of warbler migration, but our shorebird migration has been okay. And so there's been lots of spotted sandpipers in many different places. And Lori spotted this nice specimen over at Geneva Wilderness Area. And you can see it's in breeding plumage and she got a great shot of it. So keep your eyes out for those uh, shorebirds because right now they're in and you know what kind of rain tomorrow morning might be a good time to look for some, just saying. Okay, next, I think that's the end of that. Okay. So we're gonna start talking about Wakaiwa Spring State Park as a birding hotspot. And this park is very beloved to us. We consider it the crown jewel of the state of our award-winning state park system. And it's very popular with families for the spring and the, the price is right. A whole carload full now is $6. And on holidays or even during the COVID period, 
there was a line even on Saturdays and Sundays, not just holidays. So if you're going to go birding there, first of all, it opens at eight, so get there at eight. And it's very popular for the spring, for the river, and for hiking. And here's the park biologist, Paul Lamardo, uh, leading a trip for Audubon folks from around the state. And we'll be talking a lot about the special habitats and the prescribed burning. And he has been in charge of that for quite a few years. And upon his request, we have been doing surveys to study the benefits of prescribed burn on bird populations. Kathy leads these surveys. I think we've been announcing them each bird chat and you're welcome if you're local, you're welcome to contact her to join them. And this one it, picture is kind of fun of an early one. It's not wasn't the first one, but it was an early one um, because we have two young ladies that were um, participants in a survey 20 years ago at Wakaiwa, Nancy Prine and Joyce Studefang. And then we have the new avid birders in the group. And so the surveys continue monthly and they're a lot of fun. <clears throat> and then at the North Shore Birding Festival, the January 2020, we had this trip um, in Wakaiwa Spring State Park, popular with, with the tram. Uh, that was pre-COVID. And this past year, we had the December 2020 North Shore Birding Festival and we used the youth camp. And so we were able to really expand our activities at Wakaiwa Spring State Park. It here shows the people gathering for a night hike. Um, that was for Whip Wills and Woodcox. And, um, and Kathy's gonna tell you all about that. And we also had a canoeing trip. So that festival is gonna be December 2nd through 6th. Uh, those of you from out of town, uh, you might think about coming down and might already look, start looking for your lodging. <clears throat> now, Wakaba Spring State Park, which is um, here, um, is part of the Wakaiba River system, which is a national wild and scenic river designated October 2000. So it's one of two national wild and scenic rivers in Florida, along with the Loxahatchee River in South Florida. And all of these parts are part of the national wild and scenic river system, which is a state, a national park system. Um, so here is Rock Springs Run, starting up at Kelly Park, coming down and joining the Wakaiva River. Here is Wakaiva River, starting at Wakaiva Springs. And by the way, the thing about Wakaiwa, Wakaiva, Wakaiwa is supposed to be for the spring, bubbling water, as opposed to Wakaiva for the river, flowing water. But we, of course, we are, we mix it up a lot. And there's another tributary that's not part of the scenic river system, the Little Wakaiba. Okay, so you're going up here and going up, and then there's a tributary that starts up in Lake County, Blackwater Creek. And that then together they join the St. John's. Um, and the St. John's goes north to Jacksonville. So it's a fabulous river to canoe. And I really recommend it if you've never done it. Oops, I'm sorry, that was a very important slide. I gotta go back. Okay. Um, so the land, the state park land, uh, apologies, let's try one more time. Okay, the state park was purchased starting in 1969 and then the other parts, Rock Springs Run State Reserve and Seminole State Forest were purchased in the, seven, the 70s and 80s with purchases ongoing. Uh, so there's over 70,000 acres in state hands, and but there's still more to connect to the Ocala National Forest. And this it shows the Ocala, Wakaiva Ocala Greenway project, which is a Florida forever project. It's been listed very near the top for many years, but things have been kind of stalled because as you know, development has exploded in the area. And so it's hard, the price gets really high for these parcels to connect. But the goal is to connect to the Ocala forest. 
and that is for the survival of the Florida black bear, which is we call an umbrella species. If we save the black bear, other species come along with it. It saves habitat for other species too. Now, Wakaiwa Spring State Park has a great diversity of habitats. And this is the technical habitat map from the park management plan. This is the river. So there's floodplain swamp along the river. Then the lowland up from that is called hydrothermic, all this HH. And then this ridge here is the sand hill that we're going to be talking a lot about. So I'll start with the habitats with the one that's most extensive, the hydrocamic. And this is at the festival. Kathy and I gave a beginning birding class to a family of little kids. And we were going into this boardwalk walk that they call the wet to dry walk right near the spring. Here's, here's another picture of that. So it's full of um, cabbage palms, needle palms, ferns, and deciduous trees, deciduous and evergreen trees that are adapted to a kind of wet environment, the hydric hammock. Hammock is the word in Florida for a hardwood forest, and hydric, of course, is wet. Um, some of the birds of the hydric hammock are pileated woodpeckers, um, yellow bellied sapsuckers, and here on a sweet gum. The yellow bellied sapsucker has made the cavity holes, wells that sap comes up and that catches insects, which he later, he or she later goes and picks out. And here are a few plants of the hydrocamic, the button bush, beautiful plant. And I want to mention the tulip tree. This is an Appalachian tree, gets really big in the Appalachians. And here it's at its very southernmost point. When I found it in the 90s at Wakaiwa, I was just really thrilled. And it's also at Spring Hammock, but this is pretty much the southernmost point of this. And by the way, along with the tulip tree, there are other Appalachian trees of the farther north that are kind of at their southern edge at Wakaiwa. Going on on the habitats, sand pine scrub near Sand Lake. And when you see oaks, these are scrub oaks. And when it's mixed pines and oaks, you call it scrubby flatwoods. But if it's pure, um, pure oaks, you can call it scrub. And these are the sand live oak. And a bird that we always see in this habitat is the eastern towhee. Oh, we hear first and then we see it scratching along the ground. And our towhees are the yellow-eyed form. As for the Florida scrub jay, which should be in the scrub, Wakawa Spring State Park does not have enough scrub to support them. Um, nearby, adjacent, Seminole State Forest has a good population of scrub jays and has been managed for scrub jays. And they have now crossed and been relocated, a combination of natural expansion and relocation to Rock Springs Run State Reserve, which is just south of the Seminole State Forest, below uh, south of 46. And, but there's not enough scrub at Wakaiwa to support scrub jays. Sand Lake was a dugout lake from a long time ago that has a beautiful natural vegetation around it and it's fun to visit uh, when you do the hike or bird walk, um, bird count. And Kathy got this great picture of a white-eyed vireo family right near Sand Lake, right there in the wax myrtles. And in the sand hill, there is a lake Lake Pravat, and we include that in our hikes and bird counts. So I'm just showing you the variety of habitats that we have at Wakaiwa before we turn it over to the birds. We talk about the more about the birds. But the most interesting habitat to birders is the well-burned sandhill habitat. 
And Wakawa Spring State Park has 1,246 acres of sand hill, the largest expanse of this fire dependent habitat in the Florida State Park system. Now in the old days, ranchers conducted prescribed burns in the winter. Their purpose was to keep the ticks down, get some new growth, and it was more manageable in the winter rather than with summer winds and heat and thunderstorms and all. But with winter burning, the dominant grass ground cover plant, the wire grass, didn't reproduce well. Now, Wakawa Spring State Park has a youth camp where rangers throughout the state park system are trained, including on prescribed fire. This youth camp was established by the Florida Federation of Garden Clubs for Environmental Education of Youth at, at summer camp. And Kathy's actually a counselor there every summer and knows it intimately. Um, and I know it quite well because we hike through there a lot. Um, so anyway, um, one year in the early 1970s at Ranger Academy, they did a prescribed burn in the summer. Voila, the wiregrass reproduced. So they learned then that you need to do your prescribed burning to imitate nature when it would happen with summer thunderstorms and lightning. And along with the wild grass came other grass species and many types of wildflowers. So you started getting much more diversity. Nature's occurs with the summer thunderstorms ignited by lightning called growing season fires. So um, it's hot. It's, the winds could be unpredictable in the summer. It's not the favorite time for humans to do fire, but it, you gotta do it in order to get reproduction of that key plant, the wire grass. Along the park road, we often have the chance to see the prescribed burn still going and um, the char. It's a challenge now with all the neighborhoods nearby, but they communicate with the neighborhoods and I guess things are pretty good. The neighbors understand that they, they moved there to, after the park was established. So it kind of comes with the territory. And Kathy got the, excuse me, Susan got these great pictures after the burn. Within five days, the wire grass is peaking up and the deer love that new growth. Uh, also here we have a grass stage of the longleaf pine. It survived the fire. So this whole sandhill habitat with the longleaf pine and wiregrass understory, all the flowers and everything, it's adapted to the prescribed burns. And especially in the fall, after the burns and after the um, rains, you get all the wildflowers. So the benefits of prescribed bio fire are that dead plants are removed, reducing the risk and severity of wildfires. Open space is created by the thinning of underbrush and that benefits plants and wildlife. And nutrients are returned to the soil, increasing plant growth. And the wildlife benefits from the new growth and maintenance of the savanna-like community structure of the sand. The fire dependent bird species are the Bachman sparrow, the brown-headed nuthatch, the red-headed woodpecker. In our area, it's, it seems to be fire dependent. In other areas, not, not necessarily. Um, the northern bob white and the Florida scrub jay, which is not at Wakaiwa, as I've mentioned. And the red cuckaded woodpecker, which is not currently in the Wakaiwa River Basin. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Kathy to talk about these particular birds. Okay, so I'm gonna start we're letting you hear the song of this wonderful bird. All right, so if you come to visit Wakaiwa, starting in about April through the summer, that is what you're gonna hear often as you're driving in the roads. Um, 
you're going to hear the beautiful song. We give it the mnemonic. Well, I didn't make it up, but it's given the mnemonic of here, kitty, 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 kitty. Um, and it's wonderful. Um, it's a it's the only native sparrow besides the very, very rare Florida subspecies of the grasshopper sparrow that breeds in Florida. All the other sparrows head north. Um, and so this is our, our native um, sparrow. And you can go to the next slide, please. And if you're lucky, and this is the best time of year really now and through the summer to see one, you'll get a male up and singing and they'll either be on pine trees and they could be a little hard to spot because as you see, they're perfectly adapted to blend in um, with the coloration of the pine trees and the grasses. In the winter time, it's really challenging to find one because they're not singing and they just have a very, very soft. Next slide, please. But um, for example, this picture was on one of our surveys. It was back. I think Kathy had a little bit of technical difficulty. So she'll be right back on. But here's another picture of that beautiful um, Bachman Sparrow. And this is the distribution. Um, it looks like Kathy just said she lost her internet. So she probably won't be back on. But as you can see, we put the little um, map of longleaf pine distribution. If you take a look at the longleaf pine versus the Bachman, you can see how these sparrows really kind of like this habitat. So they are here year round, southeast. Um, they do sometimes for breeding go up a little bit farther north, but pretty much they're staying in our area. We have a good, it's a good place to see a Bachman, especially um, at Wakaiva. Next, the red-headed woodpecker is also another one that at Wakaiva really loves that little, that area, the Sandhill area. Next. And these are some beautiful pictures from Mary Kime of the birds flying. If you wanna see them at the park, all you have to do is look for the nice, um, some of the trees, the dead trees, because they do like to put their nests in that, those nice dead snags they have there. And here's the cutest picture ever of one peeking out of a little snag. I think that's just adorable. Next, um, the distribution of redheaded, obviously they're, they're not just in Florida, they're all over in our area. They do seem to prefer, like Deborah had mentioned, um, that area, especially with the burn, um, but they are seen in different areas, other parts of the country, um, mostly on the east side, east coast, but um, you, you will see them really easily at Wakaiva. If you want to see a redheaded, that's one of the best places to go. Next, a brown-headed nuthatch. So that's another one that you will see at Wakaiva. It's another good um, bird to see. And let me do this really quickly. We're going to play you the thing. And I know I have a different bird loaded. So let me just kind of um, put him on here. And if you hear when you're going through the park, kind of a little squeaky, and that's the brown headed nut hatch. You wanna kind of take a look and see if you can find him up in the trees. Next. I'm back, Susan. 
Ah, we're right here. I just played the nuthatch. Awesome. Welcome okay. back. So, and yeah. Go ahead and take over. All right. So actually on one of the surveys, a um, couple of people discovered a nest um, in a hollowed out snag. And this can show you the importance of snags being left put. Um, and they do in the park. They're really, really good as long as it doesn't interfere with one of their access roads or a hiking trail. They're just going to leave it alone and the nut hatches definitely take over on those. Okay, you can go to the next slide, please. And um, we think this might be an adult with a chick, but um, again, I wasn't there at the time. This is a great Mark uh, Myfert. He, he, rides through there all the time and gets amazing pictures. So that's just a, uh, some other brown headed nut hatches. And like Susan was saying, they're very, very vocal. And if you hear, you, you know, you'll hear them from far away. Next. And if you notice, here's the distribution of brown headed nut hatches. Um, they're found in the Southeast year round and it really matches up with longleaf pine distribution. It really goes together. And so as Deborah was saying, this is a fire dependent species and Wakaiva really is the, um, the example, the model park for prescribed burning done correctly. And that's why our population there is so good. Next. So another bird that has just returned that breeds here is the summer tanager. And so, um, that's a male, the males are red. We'll show you a female in a second and I'm gonna pull up the sound. You can go to the next slide, Deborah. And when you're in the park, you're gonna hear one of two things. You're gonna hear this. It's like a little chatter or you'll hear the male singing, which is really pretty. And so the male's on the left, the female's on the right and they are um, insectivores for the most part. And what's really cool, they will eat wasps and bees and I've seen them do it, which is amazing. I've seen them eat really large cicadas. Um, they're a lot of fun to watch. They are starting to nest right now. And um, it's really fun to see a young male because it'll be yellow and red and they're really pretty. Next slide, please. And this is their distribution. You can see in the winter time, they're in Central and South America. And they do breed here in the Southeast and also the Central South and a little bit in the Southwest. So our guests from Arizona might have them where she lives too. Okay, next. All right, and this is a really cool bird. And, and we're just kind of learning more. Um, we know up where Susan is right now in Ohio, um, they're fairly easily seen, but we, we knew we had some at Wakaiwa, um, but we didn't know like the time period. So when we had our festival and we had some really great leaders go out and we were hoping for, you know, owls and maybe whippoorwills. Well, guess what they found? They found we had woodcocks and they were, they were doing their display. So this is here in Florida. I'm gonna I'm gonna play you the display um, sounds, and we would go at at dusk, and we would we could see it not real good because the light wasn't good. But we first we heard this call, which is the paint, and we'd hear this, and then we'd also hear the flight display. Uh-oh. Yeah, there it is. I'm here. Okay, good. Yeah. So we heard this long display and you could see them flying straight up and then diving down. Um, really cool. And we've had one of our really good local birders, Mary Soul, heard them a couple weeks ago. So we're thinking maybe they're reading here. You might be probably at the very, very end of their range. But it's really exciting to find something like that. And um, we also do have right now Chuck Will's Widow. And in the late winter, we did have Whippoorwills. So that's really fun. Next slide. 
And now I'm going to turn it over to Susan to talk about some other birds that you might likely see. Yeah. So we're just going to kind of go over some of the other birds that are seen at the park um, and often heard, as, as in the case of the Bob White, you're a lot of times more likely to hear him than to see him. But you can see him. Kathy took this picture one time when she was out and she did get to see them. I've heard that some people do get pictures of little families. So they, I think they're just a, the most adorable bird. Next. We also have a lot of wild turkeys. I mean, I do the Wakiva survey with Kathy and I think um, we see turkeys almost every time we go out. <laughs> um, safe to say, often by the ranger station, they'll be walking by, but you'll see them a lot. Um, and they seem to like that habitat a lot too. Next, um, Eastern Bluebirds. Um, this is a great picture of um, eating the American Beauty Berry. That's perfect timing. Um, but these birds are often in the park. You'll see them. You're pretty much always going to see one when you go or hear them singing. Um, and they're real, just kind of a nice bird to have in that park. So just kind of something real pretty to look at. Um, next, um, red belly woodpeckers. I think our number one woodpecker, although sometimes at Wakaiva, if you come at the right time, you may actually see, I think one time we did see more red headeds than red bellies, which for Florida, red belly is like usually the number one woodpecker. But this is one who's got his little nest hole and a snag and is just kind of probably getting ready to uh, have some babies, feed some babies. Next, Carolina chickadees. These you will hear in the park. You'll see them going around. There are certain areas they like to um, kind of stay in. We usually see one or two for every time we do the survey, we do it like once a month. So you'll see the chickadees in there. Uh, next. Okay, so the yellow-throated vireo. So those you'll hear, and I have this all ready to go. And those are singing right now um, at the park and you'll hear them singing. And so if you hear that, you can kind of start looking around and find the vireo, yellow-throated vireo. And, and the up and down where you hear my sound? Yeah, where I, is, here I am, where are you? It's, yeah. It's slower than the red-eyed vireo. Yeah, a little slower. And then, they're really pretty birds with the glasses. Now, this is a photo we took. This was just kind of real lucky. <laughs> Actually, I didn't take it, Kathy took it. Um, um, we just happened to have a survey and happened to be walking under the branch that went over the path. Just happened to have two baby horned owls right above it. The horned owls, sometimes you see them, sometimes you don't. You know, it's kind of one of those things that you may or may not see in the park. But these are the two, they were checking us out as we walked underneath. And of course we were doing the same, just real delightful to be able to see such great birds close up um, and enjoy such great things at the park. Next. Now, one of the things that you don't think of, I don't think of it, but they're still common at Wakiva is the black belly whistling duck. Um, there is that one pond, Lake Privet, and when we were there at the last survey, I think we had like 50 birds, black belly whistling ducks. So they're, they're in that pond and they're in that park. And they're, as you can see, they do breed because you can see the cute little striped chicks that are just so cute when they're walking around. So we do have a good population of those in that park also. Next. Okay, so something else besides birds, there's also a lot of things that are really interesting to see. The Sherman's fox squirrel is a really good, I think there's a dark and a light, I, I don't know if you call it version, but coloration of the squirrels. And they're just a little bit bigger and just a little bit cuter, I think, than regular squirrels. But you, if you're walking through, um, kind of a little bit farther away from where the populated area is, like the springs, you can see these Sherman's fox squirrels um, 
in the trees and they're just a real delight to see because they're so just precious looking. Next, and of course deer. I think that's pretty much um, a mainstay that you'll see in the park. We almost see them again every time we do a survey, we'll see deer. Um, there's quite a few deer in the park. Next, go for tortoise. If you don't see a tortoise, you'll see the holes. They're pretty common there. Um, they do like that habitat. As you can see, um, it, I'm not sure how many, but I do know way in the back of Wakaiva, they do bring in some of the relocated tortoises. Far back in the part where really it's, um, you, the public doesn't go, it's kind of set aside just for some of this relocating of the tortoise. Next. Okay, this one, see if I can pronounce it, the sick lined race runner. Um, Kathy's real good at seeing these wonderful like newts and lizards and things. And we do have some really interesting ones that you may not, if you're not looking, you may not see them, but you'll see one, you'll go, wow, that is really cool. And not to know that we have these wonderful other um, animals here in Wakaiva and in Florida. I love the coloration of this one. It's just like one of the best little lizards you can see. Next. Snakes, of course, there's coral snakes. Sometimes, I mean, I think we were, we were doing a survey. I've been doing it for maybe a year and a half or so. I haven't seen one, then all of a sudden one day we see two. So coral snakes are there. Um, may or may not see one, but they're, you know, they will run away from you really quickly, but they're very, a beautiful snake. Um, and of course your yellow rat snakes are in the park all the different snakes that we, you know, different ones that they have. Next. And wildflowers. And now Deborah is gonna take over and tell us a little bit more about the wildflowers because this park does have a lot of great wildflowers in it. Okay, and I will be, thank you Susan, I'll be really quick um, on these. Um, okay, this is tar flower. Uh, it's a shrub in the rhododendron family. And uh, it happens to be the namesake of the local chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society, tar flower chapter. It's quite, it's sticky. That's why it's called tar flower. And um, on the left is the scrub and sandhill version of our milkweed, Sclepius tuberosa. And this one is kind of a rare one called Fibanthus, I must have a common name. Both of these must have a common name, but I didn't look them up quick enough. So I'm using the scientific name. And this is wild buckwheat. This was one of the first flowers I learned walking around Wakaiba because it's quite common in the sand hill. And in a little bit wetter habitats, you get the meadow beauties and then the Balduina or bachelor's buttons group, you see them in the sand hill. And I think that's maybe all my flowers. And going on to butterflies, um, the zebra swallowtail, it breeds on pawpaws. So there's various pawpaws in the park. And so we get to see these beautiful butterflies. And Kathy got this picture of the hickory horn devil caterpillar and looked it up and its host is mostly hickories of which there's pignut hickory in the park, but also persimmon, sweet gum and sumacs, which are all in the park. And it makes just kind of like a orangish moth. So we're really wrapping it up and we're gonna open it up to questions. Um, where you go in the park, you could ask us and anything like that. And uh, Susan and Kathy will monitor the questions. So um, fire away. Okay. Delcy did have a question. It's from a little bit earlier, but she wants to know how are the mosquitoes for this time of the year? You know, it varies a lot in the habitat, obviously. Um, and it depends on the winds too. But yeah, if you're down in the more of the um, wetter areas by Lake Pravat or by the springs on that boardwalk that you saw that Deborah showed you, they can be kind of 
heavy. <laughs> usually on our surveys, we don't usually run into many mosquitoes. The more thing that you need to protect yourself with is there are a lot of ticks because of the white-tailed deer. Um, there's a lot of the, um, uh, the deer ticks, they're really small, um, and chiggers. So that's just something that you go in expecting when you're in this type of habitat um, and just, you know, use your favorite insect repellent. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes the deer flies can be a problem, but not as much as other places. Um, Penny wants to know, can you bring dogs on a walk at the park? Yeah, you can. I've taken my dog, um, except you can't be around the springs area. Um, dogs aren't allowed down there for obvious reasons. Um, but the other areas, and you can take your dog camping there too, but it needs to stay on a leash no longer than six foot. Um, and again, your dog, you want to make sure you check them for ticks afterwards because they are more likely to pick up those things. And I think when you're hiking, you're also supposed to have the dog on a leash. Is that? Absolutely. It yeah. always six foot leash, no longer. Yeah. Plus that protects your dog too, because, you know, there are snakes out there, not that they're jumping out to attack you, <laughs> but you know, dogs can stick their nose in place where they shouldn't. So. Um, and Delcy wants to know, are there bathrooms? Yes, there's a bathroom. There's bathrooms by the springs. There's a bathroom at Sand Lake. Um, it's basically, you now, if you don't go on a survey, there's only really two places you can park. Um, one would be near the springs. And there's a nice trail that goes from the springs to the campground. That's not one we survey, but it's a nice trail. So it's a little more heavily traveled because people from the campground walk it to the campground and back. Um, you can park at Sand Lake and then you can hike. There's different trails up there. Um, if you come on the survey though, we have special permission to park in other places and more easily access some of the other trails that we really like to go on. So that's a benefit on going on the survey is you get to access those. Um, if you go camping, which I don't know, Susan, have you camped there? Um, I have not camped at Wakaiba. Yeah. I, we have friends that do camp there. I haven't yet camped there because you know, it's one of those things close to home. Um, but it's great because then you have access to a lot of the, the, the trails around the campground are a little bit birdier than some of the other trails. So that's a good advantage. Plus, if you camp, you can go down to the springs before the park opens and have that. And, and when Deborah mentioned about getting there early, especially on a weekend, that's for sure thing. And it's an advantage if you get a season pass to the state parks of Florida, you can get what they call the early access um, permission, which is not extra. You just have to go in and register at the camp office and you get um, the code to get in early, two hours early and two hours later. If you want to listen for the woodcock, you need one of those. So I highly recommend. Um, it's, it's really reasonable. And you can even get a pass that covers eight people for the year. It's very, very reasonable. I, I recommend it. And booking the campsite, is they still do it 11 months in advance, I believe. So <clears throat> it, it would be a perfect place to stay for the festival, December 2nd through 6th and it's already time to start seeing if there's any sites available because it's within 11 months. That would be ideal to have a campsite for a festival. Mm -hmm. As Teresa put in the chat, um, we'll be renting cabins at our festival. So that's another option. So once we publicize that, you might want to jump on that. And those cabins are going to be at the youth camp. Kathy, do you want to tell us more about the youth camp? I mean, if, if somebody sure. has a child. Yeah, how yeah. Would actually, I'm sure that there's still spaces available in some of the programs. So the youth camp is a very interesting um, partnership. It's very unique, I think, in the whole United States between the Florida Federation of Garden Clubs and the Florida State Park System. The, the, the camp is actually on state park property, but the youth, the um, garden club actually... Um, 
purchased and will build the cabins and the facilities. And so it's a partnership in that the, the uh, youth camp run by the garden clubs operates June and July. And then the rest of the year, the, camp, the uh, park maintains it and rents it to groups. So a group could come in and rent cabins for a period of time. And a lot of groups do. That's something you can look into. And I believe that's also 11 months in advance. Um, mm -hmm. And if you have children or grandchildren, and I'm, I'm, I'm prejudiced because I've, I've worked at the camp for a long time and I volunteered there before then, it's a, it's a great program. It's environmental education. For most grades, it's a week-long program. They stay in the cabins. Um, they get a tailored program. There's a four-year cycle. This year, we're doing birds. And I believe there's still spots available. And that's something if you go to the Florida Federation of Youth uh, Garden Clubs, Florida Federation of Garden Clubs website, or you can just look up Wakaiba Youth Camp. It has all the information. It's really well run. It's uh, very safe. And the kids get, I mean, I'm out there the whole summer. It is hot, yeah. But we learn a lot. And you get to see a lot of nature. And some of those photos of the prescribed burns were done during camp and they have permitted us at a very safe distance to actually observe the fires because if the fires are done right, they're very low to the ground and that's the way they want them to burn. So yeah, I, I recommend the, the summer camp is a great program. And if that's something, if you're local, they're always looking for volunteers to help with that program and you can go on the website and learn more. Cool. Does anybody have any more questions about the birds? Where to see the birds? We, we like the Sandhill best because that's where these rarities, elsewhere rare birds are that are associated with the prescribed burning. Yeah, we, but the, the wet to dry trail on that boardwalk in migration can is a, is a pretty good migrant trap. So that's a neat place to check out. And in the winter, you know, in the in the fall, in the early spring, you won't get a lot of the people that are swimming and camping. If, if you go early, you won't get a lot of that traffic. And I think just on our last survey, we had a lot of the summer tanagers. If you like summer tanagers, I think that's a really good place. Wakaiva is a great place to see them. Yeah, have quite a few of them there. You can hear them pretty much every corner you turn. <laughs> You hear yes. summer yeah. singing right now, of course. But. And the red-headed woodpeckers. There are lots of nests. Even sometimes driving the road, you'll see them fly across the road. Uh-oh, Mary asked, did we show a park map? At the very beginning, we did. Oh, we, we'll, we showed a habitat map, not just the, a habitat map. Yeah, right. right. On their website, you could pull that up. Um, or pick it up as you drive in. Mm -hmm. Particularly in the winter time, if you're a hiker, um, there's a lot of trails that lead to, there's some backcountry camping that's by reservation. Um, it's, it's an amazing place. It really is. 7,000 acres and it's adjacent to the other parks so that it's part of a 70,000 acre preserved area. Now, Chris Payton wants to know if the early access passes are at all the state parks. Yes. Yes, um, you, you, you just get early access to your own home state park, but it, it, it's a recreational pass that you buy for the year and it gets you in any state park. And then you just have to go to your own park, right, to get that codes, the access codes to exactly. go early. Mm -hmm. All right, very good. And Delcy says, what a great presentation. She looks forward to this every Thursday. Thank you, Delcy. Thank you, Delcy. All right, well, we're a little short, shorter than usual today, but that's fine. Uh, thank you all for coming and thanks. Yeah, and don't forget our program next week. Next week, it's the regular, um, YouTube. Or YouTube. Just check in on YouTube at seven on next Thursday. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Bye.